I have a few moments left with you here tonight. I'm going to move quick and go to the book of Genesis. We'll continue our study that I began with you, a mini-series on the living God, God and His world. We've talked about God being God with an exclamation point. Think about how the Bible starts with exactly what we need. We peer off into the brink of, uh, of eternity and we find out it's not, it's not empty. We find it's filled with the presence and power of God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, Genesis 1.1. We talked about Him being the eternal God. In the beginning, He is there. As far as we can imagine, in eternity past, God is there, and He is greater. And greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. We talked about Him being not only God with an exclamation point, so you should smile and say amen about God with an exclamation point, he is the eternal God. He is also the Creator God. And we talked in depth about God creating the heaven and the earth. And isn't that a powerful God that can just speak the worlds into existence, the stars, and just hang them where they orbit? And, uh, and so just amazing to think about the power, the vastness of God. Certainly the chapter, Genesis chapter 1, is concerned with the theology rather than the science of creation. And uh, its concern is to say who God is and what is His relation to the world we live in. As we heard testimony tonight, when you read the Scriptures, look for God on every page. Look for God in every verse. And as uh, G.J. Wynnum put it this way, it's more than a, a statement of theology. It is a hymn of praise to the Creator through whom and for whom all things exist. And tonight I want to talk with you tonight, picking up in Genesis 1-2, about not only God, the eternal God, the Creator God, I want to talk to you tonight about the God who is present. Genesis 1-1, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Lord, I pray that You'll help us to see that You are near to Your creation. You are concerned about what we go through down here. And Lord, You are greater than any foe that we could ever face. And You are, uh, you are the one that we adore tonight. Father, I ask that You would hide me behind the cross of Calvary, that the Lord Jesus Christ would take the center place in our hearts and minds tonight, the one who is preeminent above all things. We humble ourselves before Your feet. And we plead with You, Lord Jesus, please meet our needs here tonight spiritually through Your Word. Feed us. We'll thank You for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Here we have a stage of creation where all seems dark, disordered, frightening even at times. Thinking about the darkness that's upon the face of the deep. That can be very intimidating. But God is there. And that intimidating darkness, God who is light, God is there. And He's moving upon the face of the waters. God is there. He is all-powerful. He is purposeful. He is active. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So this word spirit is an important word in the Hebrew language. It uh, is ruach. And it has the idea of wind and spirit. And so if you think about the moving of the waters, you can see, like Jesus taught Nicodemus to look at the, the moving and you can see the evidence of the wind, but you don't see the wind itself. You see the evidence of God and the Spirit of God moving on the face of the waters. Spirit is what it should be translated as. It, I wouldn't render this, now maybe woodenly, I might you know get a different angle on it, but for the translation... Everywhere you see this connotation throughout the Hebrew Bible and really throughout the rest of Scripture, it's associated with the idea of the Spirit of God. And so our authorized translators have gotten it right here in the context. We're not just talking about a mere wind that is some kind of you know, wind that's moving. There, there's something divine about this movement over the face of the waters. Because it's from the, the source of God Himself. It's the Spirit of God that moved on the face of the waters, Ruach 
It can mean spirit or wind. And you'll read different commentaries and they take different positions on it. Uh, I, I would say that you know men like Victor Hamilton argued rather convincingly that it should be translated as spirit, as I've just shared with you. But others, uh, G.J. Wynnum, who I quoted earlier, he says that it's a concrete and vivid image of the Spirit of God. Concrete and vivid image. A concrete image of God. You want to see what God looks like. He's moving here on the face of the waters. Everywhere else in the, in the Old Testament, the phrase used here indicates the Spirit of God or a Spirit from God. And uh, Derek Kidner in the Tyndale Commentary put it like this. He said, in the Old Testament, the Spirit is a term for God's outgoing energy, creative and sustaining. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So you have a rare Old Testament word for hover that also occurs in Deuteronomy 32, verse 11. And this is a beautiful picture. I love the Hebrew language. It's so uh, vivid with imagery. Get this image in your mind, okay? Deuteronomy 32, 11. We're talking about the Spirit of God moving on the face of the waters. Deuteronomy 32, 11 says this, As an eagle stirreth up her nest, and fluttereth over her young, and spreadeth abroad her wings, and taketh them, and beareth them on her wings... Now in nature, this is a mother, uh, a mother eagle that is concerned for those under her care. So Genesis 1-2, the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. God is concerned about our well-being and the well-being of His creation. It illustrates Jehovah's protection hovering over the waters. The Spirit of God moved on the waters. His care, His guidance, isn't that what we learn from Jesus? The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to do is to guide, to comfort. And so you see this in Deuteronomy, in the nation of Israel, in their earliest days. And the Spirit could have the suggestion of waiting, waiting to implement The creative word, as soon as it's spoken. Here it is. God is is moving. The Spirit of God's moving on the face of the waters, just waiting in anticipation for those next words that we're going to read very, very soon. Let there be light. And there was light. God is so actively involved in what we see. The Holy Spirit's role in creation And the sustenance of all things is profoundly articulated by other writers as well. I mentioned Roland McCune last time. I'll read some more from him. He puts it this way in his uh, Baptist Systematic Theology. By His exhaustless power, God can do all things consistent with His character and will. He can accomplish effortlessly all things that are objects of power without diminishing His energy in the least. Wait, what? Uh, Hold on. Uh, Stop the presses. You mean the laws of thermodynamics don't apply to Him? (laughs) What? He didn't lose any energy when He created. The Holy Spirit is all-powerful. The term, of course, we know is omnipotent. He's omnipotent. The Holy Spirit is all powerful in the sense, in that sense, because He is God. And McCune points us to Psalm 104, verse number 30, which is a good verse to look at. Now, Psalm 104, remember, uh, was written long after Genesis was written. And Israel has had a history that uh, she has, she has lived in the land that God had given her. And she is on the brink of facing judgment. Okay, but Psalm 104 is beautifully poetic. Uh, Such metaphor, such imagery in Psalm 104. You scan down to verse number 30 that McCune references, and he, he talks about it this way, "...what God has created by His omnipotence, He preserves by the same power, a power which the psalmist attributes to the Holy Spirit." Let me read the verse. Psalm 104, verse number 30. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created. And here's the parallel. You always want to look for the parallelism. 
Here's the parallel. And thou renewest the face of the earth. So create is parallel to renew, renewest. Those would be uh, corresponding ideas in a sense. To create, to renew. So in Psalm 104, we're not looking at ex nihilo like we are in Genesis 1. We're looking at the sustaining power of God, the preservation of the power of the Spirit of God to sustain creation. Aren't you thankful for that? Because I don't know about you, but everything I get wears out. It, it breaks eventually. Go buy a new car and drive it off the lot and see how much it's worth 10 minutes after you get down the road. I mean, things, anything with wheels on it just tends to deteriorate. But this is the world in which we live that's fallen under the curse. You see, so without the sustaining power of God, where would we be? We would be lost and undone. So we have the omnipotence of the Holy Spirit described for us here in not only initiating creation, hovering over uh, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters in this deep darkness that's there. There's a, there's a, a darkness upon the face of the deep, and that word face is a vivid word as well. The Spirit of God has an essential role as the triune Godhead as part of that in the ongoing act of creation and preservation. So here too, the ideas of watchfulness and purpose uh, are present as the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters over this whole creative process. So God is not creating things. Hear me well. God is not creating things from a distance. The deists tend to think that He spun things off and left it to itself. Others take different positions on how God created. Genesis 1-2 is, is rather clear to me in that God is actively involved. He is near to His creation. He is protecting His creation. He's intimately connected to what He's creating. One intimately concerned and involved. I quote Derek Kidner again, Tyndale commentary. An impression of Olympian detachment. Now, you've got to wrap your mind around that, don't you? Olympian, okay. Olympus, you know, the detachment of the Greek gods and things, the distance that they had from creation. God's not like that, okay. An impression of Olympian detachment, which the rest of the chapter might have conveyed, is forestalled by the simile of the mother bird hovering or fluttering over her brood. Here it is. God is involved in creation. So the references to God uh, speak of creation into existence, speaks of order. In the rest of the chapter, you're going to see things coming into order. Serves to preserve a proper distance that exists between God and His creation. So while He is near, He is also separate and transcendent. So we've got to make sure we keep a balance in this. But again, he's not some deist kind of idea of God spinning things off, leaving creation to itself. No, he's very connected, but we just need to have the proper distance in mind between God and His creation. The reference to the Spirit of God serves to remind us, though, of His close personal involvement with all His work. The closeness, the nearness of God to His creation his, and I'll say this with a capital P, presence over it, in it, at every level. Surely that should inspire us with the right kind of creation spirituality. It inspires neither the worship of nature, we're not polytheists, we don't worship nature, um, it also is not speaking of a forgetfulness of its woundedness due to the fall. We live in a fallen world, and this world is very wounded and needs the healing hand of the Lord Jesus Christ to set all things right. So we don't negate that. But what this does is give us a renewed respect for its value. I, you've seen this illustration, perhaps. It was brought uh, to my attention recently, and you know I'll share it with you. I, I think I don't even have I don't have one on me. I should have brought one up here, but you know I'll just um, 
I'll just pretend. I don't think I have any any dollar bills or anything. I think, yep, nope, that's pretty empty. Well, there was something in there, but <laughs> there's nothing in there now. So if, if you had a dollar, I can use this as a, I'll just use this, okay. This is not a dollar, but this will be my dollar. So if I had a $20 or $100 or a million dollars, oh, somebody's going to give me some money. I get paid tonight to preach. No, I'm just kidding. Thank you, Brother Tim. What do you want? Um, no, you have a hundred? You, you, you Franklin? No, oh, okay. Well, I'll go with Washington. Okay. Brother Tim, uh, you might not want this back after I'm done with it. Are, are you sure? You're sure? I, this, so I can do what I need to with this? Okay, I promise the government I won't deface it. Too bad. How much is that worth? You've seen this illustration, right? How much is it? Well, don't ask, don't ask Biden. That's not what we're not talking about here. Today. How much is this supposed to be worth? What, what does this represent? A hundred pennies. This is a dollar. One dollar. Okay, what, what if I do this? So if I offered you a dollar and it was nice and crisp and fresh, you'd take it, right? I mean, who wouldn't? Like, yeah, I'll take a dollar, go buy something with it for sure. Do you want it now? It's been abused. I mean, I've like wadded it up. Would, would you want a dollar still? Yeah, I mean, you know, when I was a kid, we used to find them torn. And even when I worked at Brinks, sometimes the machines would chew them up. If I still had, you know, at least a certain percentage of it, I could still cash it in, right? Still a dollar, okay. Still, still worth a dollar. What, what if I did this? Do you still want it? Still want it? Now, I could do worse things to it. You know, sorry, Brother Tim here. I told you you might not want it back after that. <laughs> we'll, we'll clean it up. I'll try to straighten it up a little bit. It, it's, it's worse for the wear than when you gave it. It was nice and crisp when you gave it to me. The value. The value of creation. Would you like it back? See, he still believes that it's, it's got value. It's got just as much value as when he gave it to me. It's still worth a dollar. It's been beat up. I mean, I pulverized it. I stomped it under my feet, but it's still got value. This world has been marred. And creation has been ruined and marred by the fall. But I hope you can hear the heartbeat of God tonight. When he created it, it was so valuable. When, when God brought you into this world, as a precious little baby, when, when God allowed you to, to be part of His creation, I want you to understand how much you mean to Him. How much you're worth to Him. His heartbeat for you is that you are worth so much to Him that He was willing to let His Son come and die for you so that He could buy you back and redeem you. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. It shows us His intimacy with His creation. There's a proper distance, yes, but it gives us a new respect. We're not worshiping nature we're not forgetting how wounded the world is and creation is because of the fall, but it gives us a fresh respect of the value of the creation, a delight in the beauty of creation, its complexity. One of the things that always has amazed me is the creation of little fingerprints in the womb, you know, little fingers and little ears and how tiny they are. And I thought about that afresh and anew today when I was sharing the message from Luke and I talked about that little baby thing and I thought, you know, and I'll clarify this, you know, it might have been misunderstood this morning about me saying the devil getting one up on God's creation. Uh, Jesus was not created in the sense that he didn't already exist. He was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. And so God, who was already in existence, robed himself with human flesh took upon Him the form of a servant, was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. But think about that little baby in, in Mary's womb, conceived of the Holy Spirit. God in that little, that little baby. And, and, you know, the formation of Jesus of Nazareth's little fingers and His ears. And 
I just thought about, wow, God being so involved that He would come and do that for me. The complexity of creation, being fearfully and wonderfully made, the desire to recognize God in all His works. Paul reminded the Athenians on Areopagus of something. The one eternal God, infinite in power, unchanging in His goodness, still holds in being all that He called into existence and their processes. Think about it. Every blade of grass, each leaf on a tree, the gnat, the great whale, as one writer put it, mountains and solar systems, our own selves fearfully and wonderfully made. He is the God who is in touch with His creation at every level subatomic, macrocosmic, and every level in between. When the insect lands on our hand or the stars shine above our heads, we can worship the God of wisdom, power, and unchanging faithfulness. Here's what, God, uh, what Paul reminded the Athenians of on Areopagus, Mars Hill. Acts 17, verse 27 and 28. Acts 17, 27 and 28. That they, the creation, should seek the Lord. If happily, not happily, but happily, by, by chance, by circumstance, they might feel after Him. You almost get the image of someone groping in the darkness, trying to see, can I find the Lord? If haply they might feel after Him and find Him, though He be not very far from every one of us, for in Him, in who? In God. In Him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also His offspring. So He is the God who is present. He is the God of order. Number five, He is the God of order. I, I'm on number five in my notes. I know you probably lost track a long time ago because I started with number one, God with an exclamation point. This is number five, the God of order. So what we have in the process described in Genesis 1 is God ordering the earth. The phrase uh, that's translated here in chapter 1 and verse number 2, and the earth was without form and void. Uh, beautiful in the Hebrew, it actually uh, has some assonance to it and it flows. Tohu vabohu, or wa if you use the newer pronunciations, but I'm, I, I think it was closer with the V's and so that's how I say it. Tohu vabohu, you can hear the rhyming even in the Hebrew language in that. You don't have to know what those words mean because they've translated it for you. It's kind of like the guy uh, asked you know, in the Bible quiz one time, what does justification uh, mean in the Greek language? And you just answer justification because it's translated for us in English. You have it here. What does tohu vabohu mean? It means without form and void or empty. Now, be careful here because theologians of days gone by have read into this and you know come up with crazy ideas like Lucifer's flood and all this crazy stuff and gap theories. And, uh, so just read it for what it says. It says that the earth was without form. What's something that's without? It doesn't necessarily imply chaos. Now, there's darkness. We've acknowledged that. And the darkness is on the face of the deep. God, the Spirit of God, is moving on the face of the waters. But here it's without form and it's void. It needs to be shaped and filled. That's as simple as I can put it to you. So what does God do through the rest of the chapter? He says, let there be light, and there was light. And then on each day of creation, we read that He, he began to form it. He, he divided the waters from the lands, and we had the firmament. We have all of this coming together with a God of order. He's a God of order. Not only does He order things, and He fills it. It's void. It's empty. And so He fills it with goodness. And it was very good. 
So we're not referring to a chaos in the Greek sense involving a spirit of disorder with these terms tohu, vabohu, but we're looking at the creation of a disordered state, not chaotic, just out of order, just disordered in this first stage of the process, if you will. And God is the God of process as well as fiat. The thought of Genesis 1 moves not only between nothing and creation, but also between disorder and order. We start with nothing and we wind up with creation. We start with disorder and we wind up with order. One writer put it this way, Now the emphasis on the order of creation is the one most loudly heard in the opening of Genesis. It is not for nothing, and is that a double negative? I don't know. It's not for nothing that the throng of the century, of the creatures, the throng of the creatures is there called literally an host or an army. Genesis chapter 2, verse number 1, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the army of them, all the host of them. And that army does not fight, it parades. We've gotten away from that maybe in some regards in our country. I can't imagine what it would have been like to be part of those parades after uh, peace was declared finally and the war was over and our boys, our men and women, our service men and women finally got to come home. The celebrations in the streets and the parades. This is an army that, that parades. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. We can also see a pattern of movement that emerges through the rest of the chapter. So after Genesis 1-2, we move from the gen general to the particular, as Victor Hamilton pointed out as well. And notice the ways in, in which days 1, 2, and 3 parallel days 4, 5, and 6. When we talked about Genesis and Old Testament with our students, I pointed out the parallelism that's there. And uh, you have the first three days in parallel with, the, with, the, uh, with days 4, 5, and 6, each moving in, in each case from form to fullness, uh, from preparation to accomplishment. He creates something, and then on the parallel day, he puts something in it. He moves from disorder to order. So, for instance, the light and dark of day one are there to prepare us for day four, the lights of the day and the night in day four, the parallel. The creation of sea and sky on day two, that prepares us for the creatures of water and air in day five, two and five. One and four, two and five, three and six. So we have the fertile earth on day three prepares us for the creatures of the land to inhabit it in day six. And all of this, this triad, triad points to the act of forming first, and then the second to the acts of filling. He formed it, and He filled it. Go back to the verse. Simple. Simple now. It was without form and void. So what did God do? He formed it, and He filled it, so that it was no longer in its original state. What a beautiful God. What a beautiful thing He did. And so we, we have this personal involvement, and it's specified at every point as the chapter moves through the creative process from disorder to order. And this is in this process of separation takes place between light and darkness, clouds and ocean, sea and land. The process of population, classification begins among plants and trees, birds and fish, animals and human beings. Hey, i got to tell you, when Adam was told, go name all the animals, he had quite a job to do. And he did it with brilliance. He did it with brilliance. Nobody had to tell him that that was called a hippopotamus or an elephant. And he probably didn't call it that either because I don't know what they are in Hebrew. I think he was probably speaking Hebrew, but <laughs> I digress. The most important we, thing we, we're told about in this whole process is that it is God's way. This is His way. 
It's God's way of proceeding. This wasn't anything automatic that just started to happen after he spun it off. It wasn't anything that was self-enclosed. It wasn't the result of random chance, but the result at every point of His creative and directive word by the word of the Lord were the heavens made. It is His plan. His idea. His way. Eight times we read something along the lines of, and God said, and God said, and God said. Eight times we read that. And each time, it is the result of His commanding will and the fulfillment of what He purposed. And then we read at the end of it all, and it was so. And God said, and it was so. It's His way. So the author, the human writer, Moses, by the moving of the Holy Spirit of God, being a holy man of God, moved by the Spirit of God to give us the Scriptures, is writing here in Genesis 1, he's concerned with order, pattern, categories which he sees in the creation around him. David Atkinson comments this, and he says, Here is a mind that is not far from the interests of science. Indeed, the whole enterprise of science rests precisely on the assumption of an ordered world in which pattern can be discovered and categories established. The ordered rationality of the created world deriving from the transcendent rationality of the creative, capital W, word, is a basic assumption, not usually expressed in those terms, of natural science. There would be no science at all without an ordered world. However, the natural order of the world is not a logically necessary order. It could have been otherwise. And this, the, the dependent derived and contingent order of the world is a fact that provokes endless research. Countless investigation. We still haven't found everything out there. We're still searching out God's creation. Now don't throw anything at me, okay, but Stephen Hawking in one place asked this question. Stephen Hawking. And I quote him, okay, so don't, I, don't throw anything at me. Just listen. Okay. This is from him. He says, what is it that breathes fire into the equations and makes a universe for them to describe? The usual approach of science of constructing a mathematical model cannot answer the questions of why there should be a universe for the model to describe. Why does the universe go to the bother of existing. Stephen Hawking. Genesis and the entire Bible has the answer to his question. And here it is, friend. The answer to Stephen Hawking's question, why should the universe even exist? Why should it even bother? The answer to his question is not a what. It's a who. A who that I trust you know personally. Because think about it. I can't go back to the garden and see what was all there. I can't I can't investigate those things and reproduce those things in a laboratory and study them like science empirically in that regard. It's historical science, as Ken Ham points out. It's all in the past. There's no way we can reproduce the same circumstances and know that we've gotten it right. We have nothing to compare the data to. We have to take it by faith. But you know what? I can do one better. I can talk to somebody who was there. I know it's simple, isn't it? Uh, call me what you want. But I can talk to the God who put it all in existence. 
And I can open the Scriptures and I can say, Lord, I believe You created this world and that You were intimately involved in every step of it. And You, went, you took this world from disorder to order. And can I tell you, He did that for creation, but He did that for my life too. If you would have known me before I was saved, I was so out of order. Just disorderly in every way. I was just, just a mess. I was just a mess. And I was empty. I was empty. And I was longing and yearning for someone to see value in me. And that someone did. And his name is Jesus. And he came into my life when I believed on him by faith. No longer was my life disorder and disarray. He came in and gave me one step after another to put it all in order and to follow Him and say, I have a perfect will for you. I want you to receive my blessings. And not only that, I want to fill you too. I don't want you to be empty anymore. And God came into my life and took up residence in me. And I get to be a partaker of the divine nature, Brother Scotty. I have God living in me now. I'm no longer empty. And you do too if you're saved. Have God living in me. I'm no longer all disordered and, and life all crazy and, and, and just a mess. I'm, I'm actually doing something for God that's, that's meaningful for eternity. And, and I have purpose in what I do. And, and I love my Creator even more. And not only that, Jesus is with me. Everywhere I go, He's with me. Day in and day out. And that thought can either be a help to you or a torment. <laughs> If you're not walking where you, you ought to be, that, that's going to plague you, the fact that, that the Lord's with you everywhere you go, but it ought not be a torment to you because His grace and His mercy are there for you each step you take. So I hope tonight, as messy as life can be sometimes, I hope tonight that you, like me, have the assurance that your life is in Jesus Christ, the God of order, the God who is near, God with an exclamation point. The eternal God. God who is eternal, eternity past, but He is the near and present God in His creation. And He is a God of order. And I'm thankful for that.